Hi, I'm Mark Lynch, Director at the Institute for Middle East Studies at George Washington University and the project on Middle East political science. Welcome back to our POMEPS Conversations, a series of chats with leading scholars in the field. With me today is Kerry Rusevsky Wickham of Emory University and author of the new book, uh, The Muslim Brotherhood, Evolution of an Islamist Movement. Um, welcome to Washington. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. So the Muslim Brotherhood is the culmination of decades of research that you've been doing on, on the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. And maybe we could start, if you could just tell us a little bit about what you thought the most important or the most interesting findings that you had uh, after decades of researching this movement. Well, uh, you know, the purpose of this book is to break into the black box of, Islam, of, of an important Islamist movement organization and explore the nature of factions, the nature of internal debates. Uh, and you know, one of the things that um, the book does is to compare internal developments in the Muslim Brotherhood with similar groups in Jordan, Morocco, and Kuwait. And one of the key findings of the book is that the involvement of Islamist groups in the formal political process and interactions with other groups uh, has had a important effect in all of the groups under study in this book, and that is to uh, give rise to a new reformist faction uh, with uh, different understandings of Islam, more progressive understandings of Islam than more conservative factions. And where the groups differ is in the relative power of the reformist faction within uh, the group as a whole. So wh when do you see the reformist factions doing well? Well, <clears throat> they uh, you know, sort of come into being in the 1980s and 1990s, and Egypt in particular, they are the leading force in the professional associations, you know, this, the professional syndicates, uh, which become under their control important sites of Islamist political experimentation. Uh, but in Egypt, the reformists were never really able to break into the upper echelons of, of power within the organization. And what was interesting in my conversations with some of, of the figures in this faction is when they explained to me that they were very busy holding conferences on human rights and democracy and meeting with secular civil society activists and foreign journalists, and they did not pay adequate attention to building a base within the Brotherhood as a whole. So did you come away thinking then that this was a narrow slice of the organization and not the organization itself? It, it is a, a subsection of the broader organization that in a way lost or you know, never developed an institutional, a large institutional base uh, among the Brotherhood's rank and file. And this is, you know, something, uh, and some of the reformist leaders um, in the years leading up to the, uh, the Egyptian uprising became so frustrated with the autocratic leadership and insular mindset of the old guard that they broke away from the Brotherhood and decided to pursue new initiatives of their own. And that had the effect of diluting the weight and influence of the reformist faction within the Brotherhood itself. And you saw that, it's a, it's a repeated pattern. You saw the same thing in the 1990s. You described that in, in considerable detail, the breaking off of the Wasat Party, mm -hmm. um, the defections, and, and the people leaving in the late 2000s. Uh, and did, you see it again you know, in even uh, you know, more noticeable form after the uprising with the opening of new political uh, you know, freedoms that even more of the, the key figures, people like Ibrahim Zafarani, for example, Abdelmenem Abu Futuh, also leave the Brotherhood uh, and you know, leave it even more, uh, more notably under the control of the old guard. And there's two ways you could read that, right? You could read it as the Muslim Brotherhood itself is this uh, tightly disciplined autocratic institution and anytime anybody shows a sign of independence, they get kicked out. Or you could read it as this is an internally vibrant organization with lots of different factions and generational divides and looking inside the black box shows that there's a lot more going on than meets the eye. But it seems like you incline more towards the second reading of it, but is that right? I, I think it's both, actually. I mean, there, there is, uh, you know, there are vibrant debates going on within the group. There is a broad spectrum of opinion. Uh, you know, the Muslim Brotherhood's an umbrella organization, as are all of the, the mainstream organizations of the Sunni revivalist movement that encompass a wide array of opinion. 
but when you look at the leadership structure, uh, really the, the, the main story of the Brotherhood is the, staying, is the story of the staying power of the conservative old guard and uh, its allies and associates in you know, the branch offices of the organization. And the failure, inability of those with a more progressive, you know, open approach to be able to cultivate a strong mass base. Now, if you go back, uh, all the way back to your earlier book on mobilizing Islam, you've always paid a lot of attention to the, the recruitment process mm -hmm. and to the ways in which the Brotherhood is able to build and spread this Islamic society. Mm -hmm. Since, uh, certainly since July 3rd and the military coup, it seems there's been this very sharp backlash against uh, Islamist movements, against the Muslim Brotherhood. Why do you think that is? If they were so successful at building this parallel Islamic society that you describe, then why now such a backlash against it? What happened to that mm -hmm. Islamization? Well, that's a really good question. Uh, I think we have to distinguish between the Brotherhood's core activist base and you know general trends in Egyptian public opinion more generally. Uh, when we look at the first round of the presidential elections uh, in May 2012, mm -hmm. uh, where Morsi is one of you know, a wide, array, wide range of candidates, uh, he won about 24% of the vote. And I think that re reflects sort of the Brotherhood's core constituency. And and, that, that's close to what people had projected. Right. So, you know, when he wins, uh, you know, in the second round, a lot of, you know, I think those voting for Morsi were really voting against the, you know, the deep, the old order, you know, as, as represented by former Air Force Commander Ahmed Shafiq. And, you know, people who are willing to give the Brotherhood a chance to see how it would perform in government. And I think a lot of them became profoundly disillusioned with, you know, the perceived both arrogance and incompetence of the Brotherhood in power. Uh, whether or not the Brotherhood has lost the support of its core constituency is a different question. And I think that the, you know, the jury is yet out. Well, if the Brotherhood is such a tightly you know, hierarchical organization, what happens to it when the leadership is in jail and there's so much repression going on? And, and as you know, they've largely been expelled from the professional associations, which had been their stronghold. I mean, does the Brotherhood survive? I think it will survive. I, I think that it's going to become more local. I think that uh, you, you're going to have, you know, second tier and you know third tier leaders come to the fore, and the and the you know now that the the top leadership is in prison and uh, you know it, in some cases being kept basically incommunicado. I mean, the, it's true that the vertical structure of the chain of command is broken down, but at the local level, I could see. Um, the group, you know, um, seeking to uh, preserve its solidary networks and, you know, quietly and as much as possible under the state radar, uh, you know, c continue its activities. One of the things that you argue, uh, looking back at the earlier period, looking back at the Nasser period, is that the repression of the state had dual effects. It did create Said Qutb and the move towards extremism, but it also convinced Absolutely. a lot of people to you know, retreat, become more acceptant of the state, and uh, to moderate, such a, if you use that term. Do you think that the same thing is going to happen now, or Absolutely. is something different today? No, absolutely. I, I think that the uh, you know the, the Morsi's ouster has is generating a great deal of disillusionment on the part of particularly younger uh, members of the group who feel that you know, the leadership of the group has failed them. But they're coming up with different, um, you know, uh, different understandings of the problem. Right. You know, f uh, on, on one end of the spectrum are those who feel that the, the, brother, you know, the brotherhood, that, it's, that, it, that they have, they're beginning to lose faith in the democratic process. And I, I think you could see increasing recruitment into jihadist groups from angry, frustrated, and increasingly radicalized uh, youth um, who feel that, you know, that working within the system has clearly failed. On the other hand, we are beginning to see the emergence of groups of brotherhood youth that are forming new uh, initiatives, uh, including the circulating of petitions uh, calling for a vote of no confidence in the senior leadership of the group. Uh, gr there are groups like Brotherhood Without Violence, 
and uh, Ikhwan Ahrar, the Free Brothers, who are saying we are still committed to the Brotherhood mission and the Brotherhood mm -hmm. idea, but we have lost confidence in the senior leadership. And they're calling for a fundamental overhaul in the group's leadership structure and, uh, you know, basically arguing for the shift to a more open, inclusive type of uh, you know, Islamist group. But the lesson of your book is that they're going to fail, right? That, uh, that they will develop these new ideas, they'll fail to affect the core leadership, and then eventually they'll leave the organization. Well, or is something different now? No, means... something is different now. Because now that you know, the, the Brotherhood has suffered this devastating setback, uh, and you know, I think the leadership has been discredited in, a, in an unprecedented manner. I think that we're going to see broader processes of fragmentation and evolution within the broader Islamist movement sector in Egypt. And I could see the Brotherhood splintering into a variety of, of groups and organizations. Um, when people say, well, what's going to happen with the Brotherhood? I mean, I think the future is fraught with uncertainty, and I, I certainly don't. Uh, I'm not a gypsy who can read the tea leaves. But one thing that I, I'm pretty confident in saying is that neither the greatest hopes nor the greatest fears about the Brotherhood are likely to be realized any time in the near future. By which I mean, I don't think that it's likely that the senior leadership is going to suddenly see the light and you know, uh, you know, abandon its parochial insular mindset, its tendency to see uh, you know, uh, politics in terms of us versus them. I think, in fact, all of those things have only been reinforced by uh, the recent assault on the group, nor do I see them willingly stepping aside for more reformist voices. Uh, but I also don't think that the Brotherhood is going to suddenly give up on democracy and uh, the political process and you know, join the uh, cause of jihad. Uh, I don't think that that's likely either. Uh, one, because um, its leaders for, for decades has socialized its members to participate in Islamic reform efforts through legal channels. That's not, that, that's a, it's become a group norm that doesn't change overnight. And even more importantly, perhaps, uh, one of the Brotherhood leaders, one of their main basis of legitimacy at this point is their claim to be the key defenders of the revolution and of constitutional legitimacy in Egypt. And that is a you know, very important source of legitimacy and uh, you know, support that I don't see them giving up anytime soon. Well, it, as they say, it's difficult to predict the future. Yes, for sure. Uh, but thank, thank you, Carrie Yosefsky-Wickham, uh, author of The Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, thanks for joining us. My pleasure.